Take as long as you want, whatever the Lord leads you. And uh, I'm going to sneak out. Kids, let's head on downstairs for Pastor's Pass. Got a clock right there. I was going to throw my phone out there. <laughs> There's also a red light and a green light. It'll tell you when you got you got more time and less. Okay. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. My name's uh, Alan Cox, and uh, my wife, you'd stand, babe, is my lovely wife, Elizabeth. Uh, my uh, aunt Sandy and my aunt Pam and my mom and dad and my grandma and grandpa all came up to uh, see us and hear us preach tonight. Um, Give my testimony. Um, I grew up in church, and I grew up uh, here in about Jesus Christ and everything, and but I didn't get saved until I was 10 years old, um, and until, uh, October 4th, 1998, around 3.30 on a Sunday afternoon, I was standing on the second step of my dad's first church bus, and um, dad just got done preaching. <laughs> How Jesus was still had to die for me. So I went to church. I grew up. I'd already seen people get saved. I'd led people to the Lord by the time I was 10. But Jesus still had to die for me. I would have split hell wide open. I'm thankful for people like my dad and Brother Kenny and other folks and the folks in this church who will take a stand and just be faithfully preaching the Word of God. We were downtown Toledo uh, in a project home holding a service. And my dad didn't know I was the one getting saved that day. He was just out preaching the gospel. And here I am. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, I'm not usually not an emotional person. <laughs> But I'm preparing for tonight and just thinking it over the last few years and everything. And just thinking how good God's been. How good God's been. Um, I've been up in Alaska. I couldn't believe it. Going on nine years now. I uh, moved up to Alaska on my own. I was 18 years old. And I uh, decided I was going to go be a missionary uh, to Alaska ever since I've been young. The Lord called me to preach. And um, for the longest time, I so said, well, I don't know where God wants me. And then... I was a pretty young fellow, and the Lord laid on my heart, Alaska. And um, uh, Kent LeBeau as a blind pastor, and he was up there in a church up there. And um, he needed someone to come up and work with the kids, help drive them around and whatnot. And uh, he called me, and I said, well, he goes, you still interested in coming up to Alaska? We, we need some help. And I said, well, I don't know about that. That's, a, uh, uh, that's, that's quite the deal. I'm 18 years old. He goes, I know. He goes, well, I need someone to help. And I said, well, I'm going to have to pray about that. And I got off the phone, and... Uh, you know, I, I was real spiritual. I went to my dad instead of God. I went to, I went to my dad and said, well, Dad, this is, what, uh, this is what's going on. And, and um, I was expecting Dad to say, oh, no, you need to stay home for a while, and maybe we'll get some Bible college and, and this and that. And he, said, he didn't say any of that. He said, well, Alan, he goes, would the devil give you an opportunity to go serve the Lord in Alaska? I said, no. He goes, well, you better buy your ticket. That's pretty simple common sense there. And a lot of times in our spiritual life, it's common sense things. Amen. You know, Lord, the devil's never going to tell us to pass a track out. He's never going to tell you to volunteer to help out at Vacation Bible School. If you have any inkling of that inside your mind, where you're supposed to do something for the Lord, it's him putting it in there, not anybody else. Amen. And so that you don't have to second guess or judge. It's just what God wants you to do. Um, you know, we, uh, my wife and I met up there in Alaska. And if that's all I ever got from Alaska, that'd be good enough for me. I mean, she's just, she's been amazing for me. And we got uh, two kids, uh, Benjamin Judah, he's our oldest, he's two, and Liliana Grace is one. And that's one of the reasons why we're down here. Uh, my family hasn't got to see her yet. We've been up, up there in the mission field. They haven't got to see her, so we flew down and spent a couple weeks. Um, went up there, and like I said, when I was 18 years old and didn't know nothing about nothing, especially when it came to Alaska. And um, my brother, uh, Brother Campbell, may tell you about his favorite story. Um, I, had, I got up there when I was 18. I, he called me. In, uh, in November, he says, I need someone here December, by December 4th. And I said, I'm thinking, well, okay, that gives me a year. He goes, no, no, this December 4th. You got two weeks. Make up your mind. I said, oh, man. So and that, that was kind of my, my drawback a little bit there on getting up there so quick. And, um, and uh, of course, had a conversation with my dad, and here I went. And um, got up there and um, uh, got a job and started working. Didn't have any support. I uh, got a job and started working at the uh, local deli there, uh, making, uh, making little coffees. And uh, we had, uh, you know, slicing the meat, that kind of stuff, in our little grocery store we have there. And um, uh, got something around, and Aunt Pam sent me some money up to get a car. And because um, I didn't have a way to get back and forth to work. And I went out and I bought a little uh, 1981 Toyota uh, pickup, a little four-cylinder. And 
at 45 below, four cylinders just doesn't put out the heat that it should. And um, a little two-wheel drive pickup, that just didn't work out very well. And so I, uh, I left Anchorage, Alaska, which most people know where that is. That's about, we're about three and a half, four hours northwest of Anchorage. Uh, little, we're two hours uh, north of, uh, of Valdez. Most people know where Valdez is. You know, the big spill, everybody knows about. But I was just up, we're just up the road from there, a little town called Glen Allen. And I drove out and um, got that pickup, and I was uh, driving back into uh, Glen Allen with it. And um, it had an oil leak, oil froze. I don't know what happened, but it ran out of oil. And um, 45 below zero. And I ran out of heat at Caribou Creek, which is about about halfway uh, into town, into Palmer. So we were looking about an hour and a half with no heat at 45 below. That's a long time. Um, and uh, you don't usually survive that long, but I had uh, a few few things with me I had on. And uh, it's just, i thinking about this, just, man, something. Um, coming down through there, and I got into the curves and the straights just outside of, uh, just outside of uh, Glen Allen there, and the car just it had enough. It just shut off. I said, "Oh, great! Here we go." You know, I'm, I've never been out in this place by myself ever. I rode in with uh, Kent LeBeau and his wife. I've never been on this road by myself ever. I don't know anybody in Glen Allen. I have no one to call. It was so cold that my cell phone battery had frozen and shut off. And so I, this is not. There's no help when you're out there. There's just nothing there. I mean. You're, you're going to drive that two, two and a half, three hours, and you're not seeing, there's no, there's no restaurants, there's no gas stations, it's just wilderness. Uh, trees, and that's about it. There's a few lodges along the way, and that's, that's, that's about all you're hitting. And um, so we were out there, and I was uh, freezing to death. I had hypothermia stage one, and then I went into stage two, and I was heading into stage three, which was the final. And um, I was... Uh, I was sitting there and shaking my head. <laughs> Every one of my family members went through my mind. And I said, Alan, you gotta stay alive. You gotta stay alive. God did not bring you up here to kill you. You gotta stay alive. And I was sitting there shaking my hand and shaking my head trying to keep myself awake because when it comes to hypothermia, you just fall asleep and you just don't ever wake up. And I was to the point where I was I could feel my head going down. You know how when you're driving, sometimes you start to get tired. I, that's what. That's pretty much the same thing. And uh, finally, someone stopped in, and they had their car packed with their family. I mean, they had eight people in a little uh, extended cab truck. There was no way that he was going to put one of his kids out on the side of the road to put me in that truck. And he said, "The best thing I can do is finish going into town, see if I can find a truck uh, tow truck driver, which wasn't going to happen." And he said, I'll, "I'll get you some oil." if I can't do anything else. So he did. He went out, couldn't find nobody, so he brought, went down to the, our little gas station there and bought some oil and brought it back to me. And um, that, when he got there, he got there right when I needed to be woke up. I mean, it was, I was there. And um, we got out and getting out of the car and moving that amount, let me put my, my oil in. And uh, we got into, into town right by the waterworks station and uh, the, the truck threw a rod. It was done. There was no more moving from there. And so I had a, about 15, 20 minutes later, a lady pulled up uh, in a Jeep, 3 o'clock in the morning, going to Delta Junction, which is two hours, two, two, well, probably more than that, three, four hours away from us, and just happened to hit me on that time. No one else on the road. She goes, well, where can I take you? You, may, you need to get inside right now. I said, well, I have a key to the church. Just get me to the church, and I'll, I'll get from there. So I went in there, and I knew I needed to get something warm inside of me. And so I, I warmed up a cup of coffee and, and dumped some uh, hot chocolate in there. I couldn't have any food. I didn't know where anything was, so I just had that enough to get something in me. And I walked over the heater, and I fell over. And I woke up the next day uh, sometime and went to uh, call my boss. He didn't know where I wasn't at work. I said, um, my cell phone battery had thawed out and uh, was able to turn it back on and got a hold of him. He came over and checked on me. And we had a pair, our, one of our paramedics is the local uh, butcher there, go figure on that one, but anyway, so he, uh, bought, uh, Bill Bowler, and uh, he, um, he, uh, he said, well, he goes, tell me what went on, tell me his symptoms, doing, you know, his deal there. He goes, well, Alan, he goes, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He goes, if you had a good meal that day, within that last, you know, six hours or so, whatever he said, you might have had 15 minutes left. I just, <laughs> I was cutting it close. <laughs> And uh, I found out later why I survived. My dad woke up in the middle of the night and started praying for me. 
And I said, well, that's, that's, that's something. And he told me at the time, I said, that's exactly when I was sitting there and my family was going through my head and I was just saying, God, please. And not the next few hours later, my brother called. He said, Alan, he goes, I got, I got to tell you about this crazy dream I had. And I said, no, let me tell you about what, I, what happened to me first. I said, last night I almost died. I was freezing to death. He goes, no way. He goes, I woke up at about 3 o'clock in the morning dreaming you were freezing to death, and I got down on my knees and I prayed for you. Amen. I'm alive today because someone prayed for me. Amen. And, man, I'm not an emotional person. Um, taking that and how God has done thing like that time after time after time, Picking her sister up from the airport, coming out. Uh, her mom and dad have been missionaries there since 72 or 73, somewhere in there. And they've been to several villages, started several churches across Alaska. Um, and her, her sister was flying up to see us, and we drove in to the airport to get her. And we're coming down that highway, and it's a pretty treacherous road. I mean, there's places where the signs say, do not stop, rocks are going to fall. I mean, it's you're up against a mountain, and on the other side you have a huge drop-off or an icy river or something. You, you have a real narrow road, you're going on this thing. And um, we came around one of those curves, and I have a, a 91 uh, one-ton four-door pickup. I don't ever have problems with that thing. It just runs. Uh, it doesn't, winter time don't matter. 30 below, it just runs. And come down the thing, it just shut off. Old truck just shut off. And I said, what in the world? I just got to town. How wasn't this thing? So I pulled her side of the road, coasted over there, and I said, well, I'm just going to try it. Start, boom, start right up. Came around the next curve and there was a bull moose standing right in the road. I would have hit that thing going about 65, 70 miles per hour. I can, just tell you, I can tell you story after story after story how God has provided and protected and just given me what we need. And when Elizabeth and I pulled into town there into Glen Allen, uh, when we went back up the second time, I had $14 in my pocket and an empty tank of gas. I mean, we had nothing. And... Um, her parents said, well, we're going to get you guys some potatoes, and we were going to grow some potatoes, and I was looking for a job, and she out this middle of nowhere woods, digging a little spot that was clear, and she was going to dig where they uh, have, we're going to have a garden right there, and she's digging in there, and she found a little bag of money. Middle of nowhere, little, little, little uh, like a wool purse, and they have full of pocket change, all kinds of quarters, dimes, nickels, and that gave me enough gas money to get around and found a job with that money. I can just tell you, I can tell you story after story after story of what God's done for me. And, and I'm just thankful. See, Brother Allen, what's so special about you? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. I'm a filthy rag God uses from time to time. There is nothing special about me whatsoever. I better make sure I say it because my aunts and grandparents here, they know what kind, of, what kind of kid I was growing up. But, you know, there's, there's nothing special about me. I just decided one day I was going to serve God. And if I would have died, so be it. Because it's time to serve God. Tonight, studying the scriptures, this is not a subject I like to preach on. Matter of fact, I, I argue with God every time he tells me to do it. And it never works. He always makes me do it anyways. Amen. Tonight I want to talk about hell. I want to talk about hell. You go ahead and, uh, I need a few people to volunteer to read a few verses for me. Anybody want to read for me? I have you look up Revelations uh, 21.8. Someone else? Um, Matthew 25.46. Someone else? Ben? Uh, Revelation 20.15. Someone else? Just reading a verse, one verse of scripture, someone else. Mom, uh, Matthew 13, 50, and I, I got two more, two more people. Aunt Sandy, uh, Matthew 25, 41, one more person, one more person. Or Bob, Jude, chapter 1, verse number 7. We're going to get into that. We um, talk about a little bit of our ministry now. Um, we serve at Old, Old Pass Baptist Church in Glen Allen, Alaska. Uh, if you take our, our town, has about 300 people in it. If you take the surrounding area about with a 30-mile radius, you might pick up 3,000. We're in a little uh, tiny town. Our nearest Walmart is two and a half hours away. Our nearest fast food is the same. Uh, we are out in the sticks. A uh, preacher said earlier about the people out in the sticks. I said, man, that's pretty close for me. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're out there. I mean, we're out there. Where there's nothing there. And um, we have, uh, um, I'm, I teach the teenagers there, and I also uh, do the junior church work. And we, we go out preaching to a little village in Mentasta, Alaska, which is uh, 
right around 100 miles away, a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on which way you take. Um, there is, uh, we have that, we have the ministries, I was uh, telling Ben earlier, we have the dog sled uh, ministry, uh, where we have a, um, uh, the, in Alaska, it's huge dog sled racing. And some of the towns, like where my wife was in McGrath, where gas is $10 a gallon, you just, you get used to driving those dogs. <laughs> so, I mean, so there's, there's, uh, we have all that through there, and we have one of the qualifying races for that Iditarod. For those who don't you know who that is, what that is, that's pretty much the world's biggest dog sled race. Uh, they start in Anchorage, and they shoot up north, and, I mean, it's pretty treacherous. Sometimes people die. Sometimes dogs die. It's just you never know what's going to happen on that, on that trail. Um, and so we're at qualifying, so we get to see people come in, and um, people come in. Everybody comes in there wants hot coffee. When it's 40 below outside, 50 below sometimes outside, I've seen as cold as 65 below, it is, it is valuable, a hot cup of coffee. And so they come in, and, and every cup of coffee gets passed out, has the plan of salvation on it. And here you have some of the top dog sled racers in the world, not just in Alaska, not in America, but in the world, from England and Ukraine and Russia and all these places, and they're reading the gospel, some of them for the first time, never seen a scripture before, and they have it right on their coffee cup. Amen. Right on their coffee cup. You know what they do? They, they pack that and they, they put it in their thing. We, we give out uh, uh, bags for the mushers, and inside that, that bag we have some hand warmers, we have some nutri bars, and we have a copy of a waterproof New Testament. And they take that, and they're able to read that on the side of the, on the, side of the, the snow banks and whatnot and, and read the Word of God. And some of them say, Man, I've never had a copy of the Bible before. I've never even seen Scripture before. And here we are, we're able to pass them out to them uh, freely uh, up there. You know, there's, there's a lot there, and I, I can tell you tonight about uh, all the, the rivers and the beautiful mountains. I can tell you about the, the, the wildlife and uh, the bears and the moose and the caribou, and everybody loves to hear about that stuff, but that's not why I went to Alaska. I went there because there's people dying and going to hell. That's why I went there. I've been up there nine years. You know how many times I went out and uh, went out hunting and gotten caribou? Once. I promise you there, I'm not there for the hunting. I'm not there for the fishing. I'm there because people are dying and going to hell. See, and I can preach on Alaska, and I tell you, what, I can tell you stories that will break your heart about Alaska, and I can tell you about the natives, and I can tell you about the kids, and I can tell you about all that stuff. And it, but it will do you no good unless you have a burden for your town. It will do you no good to worry about Alaska and about Glen Allen, Alaska and about Valdez and Mentast and all the little villages and all the little ministries we have. It will do you no good to worry about that if Swanton's not on your heart. Y'all with me tonight? There are people around us in this church tonight that are dying and going to hell. Do you realize that someone's first day of eternity in hell started today? Yep. Amen. Do you realize that? Someone who's, who's in the corner of office right now, their, their first day of eternity started today because no one told them. Well, I'm thankful that somebody's first day of heaven started today yeah. because something did tell them. Whew, that's good. Man, that's good. All right, who had the first verse? Revelations 2.18. Who had Revelations? Or I'm sorry, 21 8. 21 8. Sorry, I read that. There you go. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars who have their part in the which burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. Who had that? Go ahead. Thank you, sir. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Who had Revelations 2015? Wait, man. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Matthew 13:50. Who had and that? Shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25:41. No, no problem. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> then shall we say? Also unto them on the left hand, depart from from me, ye ye. Ye cursed, the everlasting fire, prepare for 
All right, Jude 1 7. Even the Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, and set forth for an example, <coughs> suffering the vengeance of the eternal fire. My question to you tonight, and I guess if there be a title of the sermon, it's this Is there a hell? Is there a hell? Is there really a physical place called hell? Or is it just something that we have in the back of our mind on Sunday morning? Do we honestly believe tonight in our hearts that there is a hell or don't we? Say, Brown, why? I, I, believe, I believe there's a hell. What are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? If there is, in fact, a place called hell, there's a place uh, where the worm dieth not, there's a gnashing of teeth, and where people are going to be sent there uh, for eternity, what are you doing about it? When's the last time you handed out a gospel track? When's the last time you took the scripture and, and, you, and you showed someone how to get saved? When's the last I wonder if I look at the person sitting next to you. Look at the person sitting next to you. When's the last time you asked them their testimony on how, what day they got saved? Well, they're my church members, Brother Allen. I don't care. When's the last time you asked them? We call them friend. We call them brothers and sisters in Christ. When's the last time you asked that person the day, about the day they got saved? You see, you may not be able to remember the time and the date, but you should remember the day you got saved. That was a choice that you made on July 4th I was standing on the top of Simpson Hill over a overlook with a thousand foot drop with rivers and everything, and I took my wife there and I asked her to marry me. I made a decision that day. I can tell you the day I got saved because I made a decision that day. You may not remember the time and the date, but you should remember something about the day you got saved. And if you can't, you have a problem. You need to get that settled tonight. You don't get saved progressively. You don't get saved over time. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. The Bible says we are not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Do you have a time and place in your life where you can go back in your mind and say, that's, the, that's, that's when I got that taken care of? You say, Brown, well, I just don't know. You need to get that settled today. You would be an absolute fool to leave the church house tonight without knowing for sure you were going to heaven. Do you just not hear the verses we read about the gnashing of teeth and the fire? Does that sound comfortable to you? It doesn't sound very comfortable to me. It sounds so uncomfortable that I'm willing to, to travel 5,000 miles away from my family and go preach to somebody. So, Brown, but it doesn't seem like you're seeing much fruit. You know what? I've seen more people saved out soul in Toledo, Ohio than I have my whole ministry up there in Alaska. But that wasn't my choice. God said, Alan, you go to Alaska. Yeah. Yes. And you go see it. If God lets me see one more person get saved, Grandpa, it'll be worth it. So, Brown, why would you do that? Why on Sunday afternoons I get up and I teach uh, junior, I teach the teen class, and then I get right down over there and I go shoot back and I start. I teach all the t uh, kids at, at kids class, and when I get them up there, most Sundays I hop in a car and I drive over hundred miles to go preach to two people. In Mentasco, Alaska. And then I get back in the car, I drive 100 miles back just to make it to church that night so I can be there to support the preacher. Go like around, you're trying to pat yourself on the back. I'm, a, I'm nothing. I'm, I've already told you that. I'm a filthy rat God used for kind of time. I just decided that I'm going to serve God whatever it takes. Yeah. I'd much rather be here with my family. I'd much rather be in a church like this. I don't have to worry about freezing to death here tonight. I've met in church when it's been 45 below with no heater. I've done that. You talk about dedicated people deciding, there, hey, we're going to church tonight. No, come whatever. We're, we're going to be at church. Those were some faithful folks. Wish I had some of their faith in me. Man, it'd, be much, it'd be much more comfortable, comfortable for me to, to go to some of the places I've been in the lower 48 traveling with my parents where I could preach the gospel for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I promise you, I would do my best there. And I would knock doors and I'd be on a bus or it'd be easier for me. It's not comfortable. 
It's not comfortable, Brother Bob, to be up there for nine years and not have over 100 people saved from your ministry. That's disheartening sometimes when you think about that. But sometimes I feel like Jeremiah, I just, I get that in my, my mind, that, that song they sing about, I just can't quit when there's a fire that burning in my bones for the Lord Jesus Christ. I just can't quit sometimes. I just, sometimes I want to say, forget it. And sometimes I want to say, babe, we're packing things up. We're going home where people actually appreciate us. And we can actually go knock on the door and see someone saved every week if I want to. We've had that conversation, haven't we, babe? But sometimes, I just can't quit. I can't, I can't look at myself in the mirror and honestly t- say, Alan Cox, you're, you can go home now. You've done your part. You've done your bit. You, you've, you've surrendered your time to the family. I can't do that. Why, Brother Allen? Because I'm telling you tonight, I believe 1,000% there is a hell on people who are dying to in there every day. If you honestly believe there's a hell tonight, what are you doing about it? When is the last time you took a gospel track and passed it out? We eat at a restaurant. We'll drive two hours, two and a half hours, wherever it is from here to go to Sandusky to, to go to Cedar Point. But you say, wow, he drives 100 miles one way to go preach the gospel? Come on. You're not going to, you're not, uh, this, is, this is reality. This is what I'm telling you tonight. This is real. And I don't mean to be cocky. I don't mean to be arrogant. I don't mean to be angry. I'm just trying to, to, to get us all to really think in our mind. There's Vacation Bible School coming up. Everybody can find a job at Vacation Bible School. If many kids run around, sometimes it takes 20 people just to handle 20 kids because they all got to hold one down. You know, there's, there's always something to do. I know I got my boys a mess. But, you know, there's, there's always something to do, especially at Vacation Bible School. And if all you do is just pour the juice cups... You're gonna, there's going to be people saved because you were there in your spot doing your job. Amen. Yeah. There are people that are going to be in heaven because you were faithful to church. See, your testimony is going to do one of two things. It's either going to lead people to heaven or it's going to lead people to hell. That's what Your testimony is how people see Christ in you. Here we have people who say, well, I'm a Christian, but I go to church Sunday morning. And I put an extra 20 in the plate. But pass out a track? No, 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 thank you. Be careful. Be careful. If you're not careful, the devil will convince you that you've done your part. He'll convince you that, that, you, that you, you're okay. You say, how do you know it, Brother Allen? Because I did the same thing. Been lots of times. Well, I didn't go out to that village this week, but... I passed out a track at the gas station. And there are sometimes I have to look at myself and be ashamed. I work at, I don't have enough churches supporting us, so I have to work a job. I work 36 hours a week at the post office. I run, a, I'm the uh, supervisor at a post office. And um, we're not supposed to talk about spiritual things or, goss- or Christian things while you're working for the government. And so I happen to lay Bibles out from time to time on the public uh, bench out there, and they disappear, so I just keep doing it. Uh, but anyways, there, there's ways you can find, there's ways you can find to serve God if you want to. I, I tell this to my teenagers up in Alaska all the time, and I'm going to tell you, at the end of the day, you're going to do what you want to do. You want to find an excuse why you shouldn't go to church on Wednesday? You're going to find it. You're going to be tired. You're going to have someone, someone's working. You're going to find an excuse why it's okay for you to stay home church on Wednesday nights. You want to find an excuse why you can't go soul winning? You will find it. Yeah. You want to find an excuse why, why, uh, why so-and-so is doing something wrong or this or that, whatever it is in life. At the end of the day, you're going to do what you want to do. If you want to be at church like you all are tonight, you find a reason to come to church. If you want to help out at Vacation Bible School, you'll find a reason to help out at Vacation Bible School. Because at the end of the day, you're going to do what you want to do. That's, that's common sense preaching. But if you think about that, that can be a deep thought. Now, I, I'm just an introduction. I haven't got preaching yet. I, I've got, I'm, going to, I'm going to try to preach short tonight. I've never been able to do that, but I'm going to try tonight. Uh, so just, just keep with me. Is there a hell? Luke chapter 16.
Luke chapter 16. You want to find a chapter in the Bible about hell, this is it. You want to peek in through a crack at hell? Chapter 16. Read it. Let's, let's go ahead and let, let's, let's read a little bit here. Let's start reading verse number 19. And after we start reading, you'll say, oh, I know that story. Blah. I want you to, I tell my, my kids at Junior Church all the time, I don't want you to think you know what the Bible says. I want you to read the Bible for what it says. That's what I want you. I want you to read the Bible for what it says, not have an idea of what you think the Bible says. So read with me. If you don't have a Bible, I'm sure there's some around. Get a Bible and let's, re let's read this. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fair uh, subsequently every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at the gate full source. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. What's the word moreover mean? Anybody know the word moreover? Understand what you're reading in the Bible. It says, it means pretty much more so. More so. He wanted to eat the crumbs that fell from it, but more so he wanted the dogs to lick his wounds. Why is that, Brother Allen? Because dogs, dogs will, will clean out those wounds for him and heal them up. A little side note there. But read what it says. There, there, the Bible can be alive to you, and it can be exciting, and you can think things through like that if you take time to read it. All right, let's, let's keep going before I get off on trails. Um, verse number, we can talk about the Lord cleaning up our, our wounds, and there, there's all kinds of good preaching in that. We're going to skip over that right now. Um, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that I may dip the tip of my finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. What did he call Abraham? Father, that tells me he had a spiritual background. That tells me he knew who Father Abraham was. That tells me that he had a little church in him, if, if, if you allow me to use that, that phrase. I wonder how many of us tonight are not sure we're going to heaven. But we know of God, but we don't know God. I wonder about how many of us tonight know there is a hell, but aren't doing anything about it. Read the Bible for what it says. Let's, let's keep reading. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in what? Torment. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Did he ask for a glass of water? A pitcher? I don't know about you, but when I'm working, it's been hot down here. Oh, man, it's been hot. According to my Alaska weather, this, this has been super bad for us. It's been hot. But I don't, when I get in, that, in the kitchen, man, I fill that glass full of ice water and I drink it. And I tell you what, I'm nowhere near as hot as what this fellow was. And I want a glass of water. If I ask my wife to give me some water and she comes back with one of those little Dixie cup things that, that my kids use, I would be a little upset. I'd say, no, I want some water. This fellow here, he was in such pain and agony that he just wanted a drop and couldn't have it. He asked for the very least and he couldn't have it. To be in such torment and pain that you would ask for the very least just to drop a finger on someone's tip of their finger. You're talking about a rich man, someone who was, who was waiting on hand and foot Someone who gave orders. Someone who, who, had, who was fair uh, subsidy about it. He, he, was good, he was well off. And here he was just wanting someone to dip their finger and just get a drop on the tip of his tongue. He asked for the very least and could not get it. Is there a hell, folks? Is it true that man's been burning for 2,000 years and tonight is screaming in hell? Is it true?
I wish we would get that tonight. I wish we would just get onto that thought and think, man, that fella is in there. I wish it would be so ingrained in our minds that we could smell the smoke. Because that's what it's going to take if you want revival in this church. If you want God to get in your heart and use you uncontrollably, it's going to take the point where you can smell the smoke off the people in hell. But I don't like to think about hell. I'm with you. I wish someone else was up here preaching this. I don't like preaching on this, Ben. I argue with God every time He tells me to preach, and I say, something else, anything else, anything else. Why, Brother Allen? Because it haunts my mind how much more I could have did for God in my life. How many times I did not hand the waitress at McDonald's a track. How many times I, I passed up a homeless person on the street and didn't give them a track. How many times I was, oh, well, I'm, i got things to do. I'm going to skip a soul winning this week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a helping on vacation. By the way, I wish to God I would have helped and done more. He said, Blah, you're a missionary. You've been on there since you were a teenager. I still wish I would have done more. So what are you going to do, Brother Allen? I'm going to pass out more tracts. I'm going to reach one more person for the Lord if I can. And if I can't, that's up to God. But I'm going I'm, I'm to do it the Bible. I'm going to try to be that man that stands in the gap. Thinking about the people around us. I asked you to, to look to the person next to you and, and, ask, you know, and think about when's the last time you asked them about the time they got saved. When's the last time you asked your family if they're not here about the time they got saved? When's the last time you asked your mother or your father or your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparent? When's the last time you made sure that you were sure that you were sure that your family was saved and on the way to heaven? When's the last time? I feel like putting my head down right now and saying, Alan, you should have, you should have asked a few, a little bit more. But I'm asking you, in your own heart, don't answer it, but in your mind, think, when's the last time you talk to your grandkids or your kids or whoever and made sure that they it wasn't just something that grandma or mom or dad or brother or sister, whoever it was, that's just something they do on Sunday. When's the last time they knew it was real in your life? That's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take. Revelations chapter 21, verse number 4. I, could, we, I got a whole bunch more information on that rich man. We're going to have to skip over that. My time's getting short. Revelation chapter 21, verse number 4. If I can turn there tonight, there it is. It says, And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Let me ask you tonight, folks. Is there a heaven? Is there really a place out there called heaven? Brother Ben, this is a good part. I get excited about this. Is it true? I'm like, Grandma and Grandpa's number up there. Is it true that I'm walking out the streets of gold for the last, what, 15 years? Is it true? Is it true that the people that we've led to the Lord uh, out downtown Toledo and, and in downtown Dallas and the people that have that died and passed on, is it true that they're in heaven today? Boy, I can't wait. And it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be something that the Bible talks about the streets of gold. That's going to be great. Man, it talks about uh, those mansions. And man, I just wonder... Because people 100 years ago had a different idea what a mansion was than what we have today. So I just wonder what those mansions are going to be like. And it's going to be something to think about. Man, I love to eat. It's going to be something to think about the food. God, God gave wisdom to men to do all things. So he gave us wisdom to make pizza. I bet the pizza up there is going to be awesome. But you know, I don't know what it's going to be like. But I just, I'm looking forward to that stuff. I'm looking forward. But I can't wait to see Jesus. Someone who I have shamed, 
Someone who I have sinned against his son. God's son, Jesus. I want to tell him sorry. And then I want to tell him thank you. As much as I love Jesus, I hate the devil. You know, it's his fault I have to go to Alaska. It's his fault that I'm away from my family. It's his fault that, that the people around us today are living some lifestyles and living away from God and away from You know, it's his fault. I hate him. You don't have a reason to hate the devil. You need to sit down and think about it. He's a scumbag. Yeah. I hate the fire out of that fellow. Go get his. Man, but I can't wait. I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait uh, to see Jesus. I can't wait to see my grandma and grandpa stump again. I can't wait to see all the people uh, that we've led to the Lord. And some of the people in the last we've led to the Lord that have passed away. Man, Lewis is going to be I can't wait to see Lewis again. I won't have to push him in the wheelchair this time. Yeah. I won't have to go an hour early to go wash him up so he can be ready for church because he couldn't move. I won't do that no more. It is. He'll be there. Man, it's going to be exciting. Man, if that doesn't do something for you, there's something wrong. Man, if you just think about how wonderful. And is it true that those people that have died and Paul, those guys, they've been up in heaven enjoying it for the last 2,000 years? Is that true? Yeah. If it is, what have you been doing about it? What have you been doing about it? If, if we believe in hell and we haven't done nothing about that, well then surely... If you don't want to think about hell and you don't want to think about the fire, then surely you've been doing some witnessing because how wonderful heaven is. Amen. Surely if you, didn't, if you didn't care about someone enough, that your family or whatever, you can just let them down to go to hell. Surely you loved them enough to where you want to take them to somewhere great. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, don't, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I love my kids to death. I'd do anything for them. And any parent in here would say the same thing. When have you Explain the gospel to them. So they're they're only five, six, seven, eight years. I was ten when I got saved. When's the last time you shared the gospel with them? When's the last time, daddies, we've got down, prayed beside the bed before they went to sleep? When's the last time in the car we started singing hymns or scripture songs on the way to church, on the way to school? When's the last time I seen mommy and daddy pass out of track? Brother Alan, you're meddling. It's true. You want to raise up another generation? We don't complain about the generation that's going to come up and we don't know if they're going to serve God or what's going on. When's the last time you stepped out of the crowd and said, hey, I don't know what they're going to do, but in this house, we're going to serve God. Amen. We're going to get down and pray with, with Him. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to listen to Christian songs only. You know, all that country and, and rock and rap and stuff, you just need to stay away from that junk, by the way. It's wrong. See, Brother Allen, I, I, I'm not too old. I'm only 27 years old, but I'm stuck in my ways on a few things. If it's ever been right, it's still right. If it's ever been wrong, it's still wrong. That junk music that doesn't talk about God and, and just, and just and, and involves your life and it talks about uh, sensuality and drugs and alcohol and stuff, you just need to stay away from that junk. Yeah. Man. When it comes to being around people who are listening to that at a party, you just need not to attend. So, Brother Allen, it seems like you're going to lead a pretty boring life. I'd rather lead a so-called boring life and stand in front of my God secure than someone he's ashamed of. Amen. Yeah. See, it's all about how much you love God and how much you love yourself. See, when I was a teenager, a young teenager, I, 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 didn't, I didn't take that sin. I, I enjoyed listening to music a little bit. And, and I enjoyed playing around some, some of that stuff. And when my parents were around, I enjoyed saying cuss words once in a while. I thought it made me look cool. Then I found out, like my dad said, cool means not so hot. <laughs> you know, there's just some things in life that you're going to have to make a decision on. And you're going to have to take a stand. Because like I said, at the end of the day, you're going to do what you want to do. You want to have a Christian family? You will. You don't want one, you're going to find reasons why what sin you commit is okay. So, Brother Allen, well, cussing's just a habit for me. I've been doing it for years. No, it's a sin problem. Yeah. 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 Well, this country music, I've been listening to it for years. It's just a habit. No, it's a sin problem. Yeah. These cigarettes, Brother Allen, I just can't kick them. It's just a habit. No, it's a sin problem. 
So there's all kinds of things in life, like I said, because we want to do them. It's a habit, Brother Allen, or it's just something I've always done or something that I grew up with. I don't know how many times I've heard that from the natives in the village. I just drink because Grandpa and Grandma and Mom and Dad, they all did. No, they're making the choice to put the bottle to their own head. And you and your sins, and me and mine, we find reasons why it's okay to do what we do. I don't have time to preach on all that tonight. I'm getting off time. But I want you to think tonight. I want you to wrap your mind around are you helping lead people to heaven or are you helping lead them to hell? You say, Brother, well, I'm just kind of walking the fence. There is no fence. It's either right or it's wrong. You say, Brother, but it's just a little white lie. It's a lie. And Sandy, how many white lies do you have to, to, be, to, to, to be a liar? To tell to be a liar? One. Brother Bob, how many times do you have to steal a little sucker to be a thief? One time. One time. See, what we do, we tell ourselves that we're doing so okay because it's just a little bit. But you know, I just listen to that country music while I'm at work because everybody else is listening to it. I can't tell you how many people I've made mad by turning my Christian music on at work. So, well, Brother Allen, you, you just be more considerate. No, I don't have to be. You know why? Because that might be the only scripture, the only Bible, the only Jesus that they're going to see their entire week is what I play on the, on the radio at work. It might be the only time they see anyone crack their Bible at lunchtime and read something. See, this is all stuff that you don't have to be a missionary in Alaska to do. This is stuff you can do now. Yeah. Everybody got a Bible in here? Yeah. You can read it much time at work. Yeah. You got an iPhone, smartphone, there's all kinds of apps that will read it for you. That God has made it so easy for us to serve Him, it's, it, it's a joke. But we still don't do it. When you hit play on that thing, you, know, the read, it, you don't even have to use your eyes or brain or nothing. You just sit back and just listen to the Bible read to you. And most of them won't even do that. Like, think about it. You can buy tapes. Well, I don't use tapes anymore. CDs with, uh, with, with, with the Bible on. You can go online, type in on, on the search engine, and you can find someone that the Bible is printed online for you. I'm telling you, if you want to, you'll find a reason. You'll find a reason to serve God. And if you don't, you'll find a reason not to. My two questions tonight was, is there a hell and is there a heaven? And what are you doing about it? Now, I can tell you what God's going to do about it one of these days. Last verse, we're going to be done. Revelation chapter 20. This has got to be one of the greatest verses in the Bible. This has got to be one of the best. If you don't know this verse, you need to read it. If you don't have it memorized, like me, I'm going to memorize it. Take some time to read this scripture. Let's go ahead and let's read this verse. Revelation 20, verse number 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire Amen. and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Man, woo! Thank you, Jesus. I can't tell you how much I hate that fella. I can't tell you how much I just, man, I want to punch him in the face sometimes. <laughs> Seems like you're in the flesh. That's right, he made me that way. I just want to get after him. I'm telling you, it's going to be something when God finally kicks that guy down in hell, we don't have to worry about it. You see, because I've had to face struggles in my life. You see, that engine run out of oil and him, me getting that cold, uh, that was the devil's fault. Amen. Me going and almost hitting a moose and whatnot, who do you think had a stick crawling that moose out in the road trying to get me? It wasn't God. It was the devil. And he, he's tried to get me over and over again, and so far he's been unlucky. Amen. Yeah, I bet you have stories of your own where God's preserved your life. You know what's wonderful about the stories we don't know about? I have no idea how many times God has saved my life up in that frozen country that I have no idea about. And God said, man, I'm not even going to let him see what's going on. He doesn't need to deal with that. I'm just going to smack the devil all the way down and just let him go about thinking nothing was ever going to happen. I wonder how many times God's done that for you. Man, there are so many things that we never see happen because God loves us that much. I said it was the last verse. I'm going to lie. We're going to go to Thess uh, 1 Thessalonians. I apologize about that. But Lord, I think he wants me to share this verse. 1 Thessalonians. Verse number 18. This has been a verse that has helped me year after year after year in Alaska. This has been a verse that when I was a teenager, it helped me then. This has been a verse that I have leaned on in my time of need. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 18. It says, In everything, give thanks. 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning who? who who's that? You. You have such a personal God in your life that He has taken time to do things to help just you. It didn't matter what everybody else was going on. It didn't matter how much traffic he had to stop. It didn't matter what was going on. He did it to help you. Then there are things that you'll never know about that God has brought into your life for you. Because he's that personal with you. Anybody who lives in my heart, he's going to get personal with me. You see, whenever I go and I do something wrong, if I were to go to a bar tonight, which I wouldn't, I'd be beat by at least three or four ladies sitting there. But if I were to go to a bar tonight, and I were to open that door and step in, you know who would step in with me? Christ Jesus would step in with me. He, I don't get unsaved for the two minutes, while, while, however long much time he spent in a bar. I guess now, I don't know. How much time he's, I don't, I don't, I'm not unsaved for that amount. When Jesus said he's never going to leave me or forsake me, now let me put a little perspective on that. When you have that burden in your heart to pass out that track, and you don't do it, who is hindered from saving that person? Jesus Christ. See, Jesus wanted to do something in that person's life, and he knew there wasn't going to be another Christian around for 100 miles, but you were going to walk right by him, by her, by whatever, at the McDonald's counter. He knew there wasn't going to be another Christian in that Bob Evans for a year, and you were going to sit at that table, and that person at that moment was ready to get a gospel track, and he prodded you. But that gospel track on that table is hand to him. Just just hand to him. You say, oh, I, I, I gotta go. It's time to go. And we hinder Jesus Christ from doing a work in someone else's life. But we decided it wasn't important. We decided it wasn't that big of a deal. Just a track for the round. How many people got saved from gospel tracks? We had one. Elizabeth and I try to subsidize our, our, our living sometimes selling stuff on eBay. On, on eBay. And a person in one of the villages out there in the last word or something. And I sat down with a pair of headphones or speakers or something. I got the church door. And um, sent it out to them. And I, I sent a New Testament. And I sent a track with almost everything I sent out. And that person got a track. In the comment section, they say, they said, thank you for the item. But thank you for the track. You've saved my soul from hell. Throwing a track on the eBay item. So around that sounds crazy. It is crazy. Who thinks to do that stuff? I don't know. Never ask you a lot of time in your hands. I think it wasted to get the gospel out. But we did it. And there it was. Someone got saved. Amen. I'm already past time. Hope their can doesn't get too mad. But I want you to think about that. Is there a hell? Is there a heaven? And what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? And what more can you do? But just remember. Just remember, at the end of the day, you're going to do what you want to do. And Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity just to be here, just to show you we love you a little bit more, Lord God, by showing up on a Wednesday night. Thank you for the opportunity just to be able to have the Bible in our hands, Lord God, just to be able to read it and, and, and be able to hear it, Lord God. Thank you for this church, Lord God. Thank you for them taking a stand. And please, Lord God, please, let every person in this room have an opportunity to see someone get saved in the next couple weeks whether it be at Vacation Bible School, whether it be someone at a restaurant, someone on the, on the street. Please, Lord God, give us the opportunity. And I'm going to trust that everyone in here will be faithful to do that and obey you. And Father, I, I promise you I will. And Father, I ask you to just be with us tonight as we continue with this uh, invitation. And as they come, Lord God, I ask you to just guide and protect us, Lord God, and just help us just to, to further our, our commitment to you. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's have a piano player come up and we'll have an invitation. I don't know who usually does this. We're going to go ahead and do it.